the interplay between these large scale plasma simulations and artificial intelligence. Um, uh, let me also um, just point at, uh, at this stage that uh, uh, despite uh, several groups already uh, making a significant progress in, the, in this coupling, uh, this is not yet mature. So there are several possible directions that can be explored. And I will I, I just pick three examples, for either from uh, work that has been done here in the group or from people that, that, uh, that I've collaborated with in the past that, uh, that exemplify this, uh, this interplay. So don't take this as an exhaustive uh, uh, review of uh, all the opportunities, but just as a, a few examples. So let me first start by acknowledging uh, my collaborators uh, at IST, Ricardo Fonseca, Tomás Gris, Maia Bradnich, Fabio Cruz and Jorge Vieira, and uh, also uh, Paul Walsh uh, is a research uh, scientist at Stanford that is moving to, to a faculty position at UCLA. And I'm going to show uh, large-scale simulations that have been obtained in a number of machines uh, all over the world. Um, so in my talk, I will first uh, give you a broad picture of uh, what are the, 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 the underlying mechanisms and the underlying physics and the algorithms that are present in kinetic uh, particle in-cell simulations. I will give a few examples on intense laser matter interactions that, uh, that we've been exploring that I, think, that I consider are some of the frontiers where uh, particle in cell, relativistic particle in cell simulations are making an impact. And then I'll give some examples connected with the, uh, with the, previous, with the previous section of the interplay between artificial intelligence and these kinetic plasma simulations. So I hope that. Uh, that this, this provides a, a broad perspective uh, for any in-depth discussions. I'll be happy to, to discuss and, and to either during the questions or, or afterwards, I'll be happy to discuss because this is definitely an area uh, where there is a very strong interest. And I think there are very interesting opportunities for, for progress uh, in, this, in this coupling between uh, particle in cell simulations and artificial intelligence. So let's 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 kick our discussion with kinetic uh, with this section on kinetic peak simulations, just by telling you in a, in broad strokes uh, what what is the what are the underlying algorithms for particle cell simulations, and also providing some numbers of uh, of what what we are talking about here. So in particle cell simulations, we are we, our aim is to model plasmas from first principles. So we follow particles. Uh, in a, in a grid. And so the, the, first, the first step, let me get, uh, let me get, oops. Okay. So you should be seeing, I'm trying to get the mouse in, in the screen, sorry. Oops, not yet. Okay, I will, I will, I will move without the mouse. So, so we first, we first uh, since we have uh, uh, plasma uh, particles, which either can be charged particles, of course, either uh, electrons, uh, positrons, or protons, we need to move these particles. So we need to integrate their equations of motions. And, and these, the equations of motion that we need to integrate are, are, are just the standard uh, uh, equation uh, of motion for uh, charged particles moving according to the Lorentz force on the most simplified version of particle cell simulations. Of course, since these, since these particles, they, they, carry, they carry charge. So we, we need to, we can, and we need to deposit the current that they carry on a grid, okay? So this is, this is the, the step that you see here on the, on the right-hand side of the, of the slide. So, so we deposit the current on a grid and then this current uh, is, of course, the source for Maxwell's equations. The currents and the charges are the sources for Maxwell's equations. And we advance the electric field according to one of Maxwell's equations. And then, and then the magnetic field is, is, uh, is also advanced uh, after advancing the, the electric field. There are different techniques for integrate the field equations. But in general, this is, this is the key idea. Having integrated the field equations, we, know, we now know the magnetic field and the electric field on the new time step. And so we can uh, interpolate the values of the electric field and the magnetic field 
on the position of the particles and then move move the particles. So this is a very this is a very fundamental algorithm. So it's uh, so the, the the key approximations, of course, uh, have to have to deal with the fact that we are discretizing in time our our equations and we are discretizing discretizing in space uh, the our Maxwell's equations, the, the solver for Maxwell's equations. There are different techniques to to solve these equations, different approximations. Uh, uh, so this this is by by itself. Uh, there's many books written about these uh, these techniques and the, the methodologies that can be used to uh, uh, to op to optimize and to avoid the uh, numerical numerical issues. So there are, there's a, a significant amount of literature in just dealing with the fundamental particle in cell uh, algorithm. There are many applications of particle in cell simulations. Uh, these applications range from fundamental plasma processes up to relativistic plasma interactions, which are the examples that I'm going to give. Uh, but the fundamental algorithm is uh, can be described in this way. Uh, the initial studies by Dawson uh, actually were not with a particle in cell algorithm, but they were 1D electrostatic problems. And then uh, this has been involved. Evol evolving uh, and more, uh, and of course, uh, more uh, more recently in the last uh, the last decade, uh, three dimensional uh, simulations have become uh, possible at a, at at a very large scale, and this has allowed significant significant progress in in many fields. I'm going uh, the examples that I'm going to talk about are examples that are driven by. The, the particle in cell code uh, Osiris, which is, uh, but uh, but the, the what I'm going to say is pretty general. There are many other many other particle in cell codes that share the same performance, share the same features. So this is, so the the core the core algorithms is it's a pretty mature uh, uh, mature methodology. So you'll find uh, many of these. Uh, Many of the things that I'm going to talk about are shared with many particle in cell codes. Uh, what is what is very what is very interesting, and this is this is where uh, where I think it's uh, a point that it's quite relevant to highlight, is that these these particle in cell codes can really take advantage of uh, very large machines. Um, uh, so it's uh, there are uh, there are optimizations for different architectures, different. Uh, Different uh, processors, uh, including additional physics, and uh, and so this is a very a very mature technology that can really take advantage of uh, machines at the edge. Just to give you an example, this is the the performance, uh, the, the parallel scaling performance on the right hand side of Osiris, at, uh, measured in a, in a machine in the U.S. Uh, about two years ago, where you can see that uh, the the code can scale up to two million. Two million cores with very high uh, parallel efficiencies, either in weak scaling or strong scale. Um, Osiris, in particular, but many other peak codes can take advantage of pretty much all the machines that uh, that we can uh, that we can have access to, either with CPUs, GPUs, or other with accelerators. So there's so this is a there's a, a broad. Uh, a broad, a broad body of uh, of know-how that allows this methodology to be quickly deployed in the most uh, recent architectures. Why why are these uh, codes uh, now uh, so widely used? I think this is, this has, has to do with the fact that uh, in parallel with the with the with this explosion of um, of uh, supercomputing power that we have uh, now access to. And it is very highlighted by the Euro HPC initiative. We also have a, a significant uh, increase in the in the focused intensity uh, that we can have in a laser, the focus of a laser. So this is a this is a plot that highlights this uh, this uh, um, this evolution of the focused intensity. So on the vertical axis, the focused intensity in watts per square centimeter as a function of time. And you see, since the invention of the laser in 1960, we've seen. Uh, in particular, after the the late uh, uh, the late nineteen eighties, early nineteen nineties, we've seen uh, an exponential growth of uh, of the available 
focused focused intensity. And this this transition here marked with CPA was actually highlighted with the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics. So to understand to understand these scenarios, in particular when we start to get to these uh, relativistic optics uh, regimes that you see here in the middle of this of this plot in green. Uh, the dynamics of the of the particles in the in the laser fields is is relativistic. It's nonlinear, and when we take into account the self consistent fields, so the currents and the uh, and the electric field and the magnetic field that are generated by these currents, we see that the the processes are very hard to tackle uh, analytically, and so we need to resort to first principle kinetic simulations, and this is where the particle and cell simulations uh, come uh, come about. So we've seen significant progress uh, in uh, in many of these uh, many of these uh, many of these laser plasma experiments, in particular in connection with plasma acceleration. And simulations have really played a critical role here. Uh, if we look at the the, the the flagship papers that have been published uh, in uh, in laser plasma accelerators, you'll see that simulations play a critical role. Uh, and it's easy to understand why. When we are running these kinetic plasma simulations, we have information about the full uh, phase space of the particles. We have information about the fields in the grid, uh, all the components of the fields. And in many cases, we can uh, post process or we can add information in real time about the radiation of these particles. So we have much more information on the simulations than on the experiments as expected. And what is interesting is that uh, uh, we are at the point where we can do 3D simulations, and this makes uh, the, these particle in cell simulations critical to understand the experimental results. So many of the, pro uh, the progress that we have seen in very landmark uh, publications associated with plasma acceleration are strongly driven by this connection between experiments and, and uh, simulations. Um, I'll, I'll just give two examples because these are closely connected with, with the high AI example, the artificial intelligence examples that I'm going, I'm going to share with you. So the first, the first example is on laser plasma accelerators. And on these laser plasma accelerators, we have a laser that is propagating in a plasma with a given spot size. It creates a bubble. There are particles that are injected inside this bubble that you see here uh, oscillating in the middle and changing color. So they are gaining energy. And of course, as these particles accelerate, uh, we form a beam in the back of this laser on the right-hand side that is changing its shape. And these particles are relativistic because you can see the electron energy associated with the color on the, on the range of 100 MeV. And they, are, they have a transverse motion, so they are also radiating uh, significantly. And so this is one of the most interesting applications from these laser plasma accelerators, these laser wake field accelerated beams. So uh, uh, electrons accelerated in, a, in, a, in the wake that a laser leaves in a, in a transparent plasma. So these, these beams are now being used either uh, to produce undulated radiation or just using the radiation coming out, uh, which is illustrated a little bit on, on top. Uh, for the equivalent uh, uh, picture for, uh, for an FEL, uh, or, uh, or just purely plasma-based where the, where the oscillating motion that you have seen inside the bubble is actually uh, uh, leads to uh, Betatron-like uh, radiation. So this is one of, one of the critical uh, uh, applications are the production of these Betatron sources. These, these have been uh, producing very bright, uh, spatially coherent X-ray radiation, and these are some some of the examples on the left-hand side that you see that you see from uh, from experiments. And on the simulations, we can uh, we can uh, we can actually get get the full the full information either on post-processing or in real time about about the radiation. So optimizing optimizing this radiation, understanding what are the experimental conditions or the theoretical slash simulation conditions that optimize this radiation is definitely a, a very important a very important problem because this radiation can be used to in many applications. So just some, some, some of the application, applications just, just go from medical applications uh, to, 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 to image uh, uh, human tissues, to biological applications, to material science, 
and also to, to laser-induced shock. So there are many applications for these X-rays, these tabletop generative X-rays. So if we, if we can understand how to optimize this uh, in terms of the laser parameters or the laser conditions, this would be definitely a significant progress. So this is one, one area, uh, one research frontier. The other, the other very exciting research frontier um, that I would like to quickly highlight here has to do with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the interplay between plasma processes and QED effects. As we go up in intensity, the electrons, of course, quiver with relativistic velocities, but at some point, these, uh, the, the velocities and the accelerations are so, so strong that these electrons in the field of the laser, they start to radiate gamma rays. And these gamma rays in turn can interact with the, with, with the laser field and generate the pairs. So this, this is now a new front that was initiated in 2009 with the pioneering work by John Kirk. There have been many, many contributions. And now we are at the point where we can, uh, uh, many groups have uh, included these QED processes in these peak codes. So how, how does this change? Uh, and this is a, actually a good template to understand other, other processes, for instance, ionization. Uh, the way that this changes is when we, are, when we are moving the particles around, integrating the equations of motion, now we, we, have, we have some probability that, uh, that photons are, are, are emitted. So there's a probability of pair creation on the, on the right-hand side on the top and to generate new particles. Of course, we need to guarantee conservation of momentum. So there's some, some recoil that needs to be inserted into the process. Then these new particles, if they, they can either be photons or they can be electrons and positrons, depending on the process that we are modeling. Uh, if they carry current, the current of these particles needs to be deposited, much in the same way as we do with the standard electrons and positrons. And then we integrate the field equations and we interpolate the, the force back on the particles and so on. So the big, the big change here is on the right-hand side, we add more particles into the system and these particles can, can either interact with the field itself, for instance, photons are photons, or they can carry current and interact with the collective uh, plasma benefits. I don't want to scare you, but uh, if we are dealing with, uh, for instance, calculating the, the rates for QED uh, radiation reaction, uh, on the on the bottom of this slide, you can see what what kind of uh, rates we need we need to calculate. The the, the structure is not is not very uh, it's it's not the critical thing that I want to highlight here. What the, the critical thing that I want to highlight here is that we for for every particle we need essentially to calculate these integrals or to roll the dice to understand if we should emit a photon or not or or if we have some uh, uh, process going on, uh, and, and this and this uh, and this Monte Carlo technique is either valid for a QED process or for ionization or any any other process. So uh, as soon as we start to add extra physics, we have these extra layers that we need to take care of, and that from a computational point point of view can be can be quite quite expensive, as you can imagine, just by by looking at the integrals that one needs to calculate. Uh, to determine if there is a photo emission or not. So there are many challenges associated with, uh, with these with this, uh, QED peak simulations, uh, which are either associated with, uh, with are essentially associated with the uh, high density. So one of the critical things is load balancing. And this, and this can, be, can be dealt with with, uh, with, the, standard, with the, uh, standard HPC techniques. Uh, and and there are there are of course also the, the questions associated with with uh, the fact that now we have many more particles being loaded into the system and we have to select uh, which particles are meaningful or we need to merge these particles otherwise uh, the memory in our system will not be able to handle such such a large amount of of uh, new particles into the system so there are merging algorithms to deal with this uh, and and this is this is definitely an area where where I see some uh, uh, where some coupling with AI can can help us uh, deal with this. I'm not going to particular focus on this example, but I just want to highlight that this is one of the critical things that needs to be addressed. And if we find smarter ways 
or uh, or or algorithms uh, that are powered by by machine learning to deal with this uh, with this selection process and with the merging this would be quite quite a significant progress uh, progress i will not uh, uh, i like what we are thinking about in, in this direction but I, I think this is one one of the critical points for uh, for for these qed plasma simulations just to give you a picture of uh, what happens, just for you to understand what is the challenge. This is, uh, these are simulations performed by Toma Grismaia. We have just two lasers and one single electron. And if the lasers are intense enough, uh, you will see in the movie, the laser starts to quiver at relativistic velocity, starts to emit photons, which are uh, depicted in yellow. These photons in turn interact with the laser field, they generate uh, electrons and positrons that are blue and red, respectively, and then these in turn uh, interact again with with the with the laser, and we have this cascade, this exponential growth of uh, of the of the plasma. So this is this is the challenges that that we need that we need to address. Um, of course, the merging the merging technique allows us to, to to address these problems. But uh, but if we get if we have smarter ways to do this in two D or three D, this would be uh, this would be ideal. And these are these are comparisons, detailed comparisons between uh, running, uh, looking at QED cascades with and without merging, just to check that that everything is okay. And uh, and the critical thing here again, just just to highlight, is just to make sure that without merging and with merging, we still get a good, uh, a good description of the distribution function. So these are different plots. Uh, the, the one on the top, uh, on the top left um, is the one that I, I want to highlight. This is the distribution function for, for the electrons along a particular direction of momentum. And the challenge is to make sure that without merging, which is the, the, the solid line, and with merging, we are describing the same uh, distribution function. Don't forget that these are kinetic simulations, so we are following following all the particles. So where where uh, let me now move to the machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, part of uh, part of the work, and I've and I will focus essentially uh, around three directions where I see where I see that the, there is impact uh, to be made. The first has to do with the algorithms themselves. There, are, there might be opportunities by coupling the standard peak algorithm with, with techniques from machine learning to actually speed up parts of the code. The other, the other component is using machine learning to, to actually uh, model and optimize experiments. And the third one is to use machine learning as, as a tool for uh, fundamental uh, science discovery, for fundamental uh, for fundamental discoveries in terms of the underlying equations um, uh, for that describe uh, the underlying reduced equations that describe uh, that describe our systems. So let me let me give you let let me start to give you a, an example. So one, one of the challenges that I have, that I have highlighted is that the, the, these cascades can be a bottleneck in peak simulation. So this is this is an idea that has been proposed by by one of the researchers here, Fabio Cruz, that's exploring this. So cascades can be a bottleneck. So we have pair production, we have acceleration in this parallel or magnetic field, we have photon emission. And we what I've what I've shown you before is that these QED cascades lead to exponential growth of the simulation particles. And the peak algorithm has to solve the Monte Carlo problem per particle and per, per time step for over more than 10 to the nine particles and more 10 to the five time steps. So this can be a bottleneck to kinetic simulations. And this observation is valid for QED cascades, but it's valid also for whenever we have some ionization process, uh, which of course might not grow exponentially like in a cascade, but still we can still we can we can uh, uh, observe in this process a, a significant increase of the simulation particles in, in the in, in the system. Of course, particle merging algorithms can help, but these they they do limit the distribution sampling. So, in a, in a way, if we can speed up uh, the way that we deal with the Monte Carlo module, this would be quite a significant progress. So, what what Fabio has proposed is to is essentially look at these QED procedures as a way uh, as a classification problem. Uh, 
and the, the, the question that, uh, that we need to answer is, should the particle emit new particles? And this is a binary classification problem. So there are simple and efficient models. We have large data sets uh, available to, uh, to, to, train, to train the models. And so this is a good, a good example where we can combine machine learning with Monte Carlo methods uh, through, through standard, pretty standard machine learning uh, uh, techniques. And this, this is an area where, where we see that there is progress can be made. This is a direction where we use machine learning techniques to optimize some, some parts, parts of the code to really take advantage of, of, of the available computational resources. The other, the other, the other direction that we see it's quite, quite exciting. This has been explored by my colleague, George Vieira and Ricardo Fonseca with, with their student Bernard Malaco is to, is to use, is to use, um, uh, in this case, uh, genetic algorithms to optimize the output of a laser plasma accelerator. This is mimicking a little bit some some experimental some experiments that that have already been made on this, and the idea is is to is to look at the description of a laser pulse, and then add add some uh, some extra some extra factors, some extra terms, free parameters that can, and then. Uh, uh, search for the optimal for the optimal parameters for a, sp a specific for a specific output so in this case study that they that they have that they have addressed they wanted to optimize what is a laser shape that builds more radiation from particles above a given threshold in the laser wake field acceleration while keeping the total laser energy constant so they so they run so they run their optimization models and they could they could uh, they could uh, after several generations reach reach a uh, reach an optimized configuration that that is plotted here on the on the on the bottom on the bottom right. It's actually quite quite interesting to to understand why physically this is the optimal combination. So there must be a physical understanding for all this, and uh, and uh, this is this is actually quite clear. If we have a Gaussian laser pulse, this is on the top the top left. Uh, a Gaussian laser pulse propagating through a channel generates these three beamlets, and these three beamlets of electrons that are the small uh, points uh, there with the different colors, they will radiate. Uh, uh, and these beamlets, of course, the, the charge in each each one of the beamlets is not is not is not optimized. When when uh, when we uh, propagate the optimized laser pulse. We see that uh, we still generate two, two, two laser beams, but then the charge in these beams is much higher, and they are uh, they are synchronized, and so there's there's clearly a physical reason why this optimization is, is, is working. So we understand why this is the optimal configuration, but of course, uh, with uh, with uh, an automatic uh, optimization strategy, we can we can uh, uh, define what are the critical laser parameters that need to be changed to op to obtain this optimized uh, output. So um, uh, so so this is uh, so there have, of course there are many different optimizations that you can aim for uh, radiation charge uh, charge uh, uh, total total beam charge. Uh, uh, Total beam or average beam uh, beam energy emittance. There are many many different parameters that you can optimize to. But definitely, this is a big uh, a big area of for for scientific uh, exploration on this coupling between simulations and and machine learning. Finally, and this is uh, what I think is the more uh, the more the more uh, the more exciting is the work that Paul Wolves is is doing at. At, uh, at Stanford, which is this data-driven discovery of plasma physics models for uh, from ab initio kinetic simulations, and the idea here is uh, is is quite simple: uh, is to use simulations as as the as the tools that that provide uh, data to then uh, and then this data is used to um, to identify what are the, the theories that best describe the evolution of of, uh, of our system. Um, so the the results that uh, that Paulo has been pursuing first, of course, one needs to make sure that we are recovering uh, the, our textbook uh, plasma physics, and uh, 
and uh, and so this is what what he has been doing and, and the steps are 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 pretty much the same as you would uh, as you would use when uh, when trying to to devise what what are the try to infer what are the equations that that describe a given a given system is that first you collect uh, you call, you make a, a random a random collection of uh, of data in this case from simulations but this is also valid for any other any other source of uh, any other source of of, of data uh, experimental data or observational data and then uh, you one uh, the goal is then to make a PD discovery uh, using uh, using these uh, a large space of candidate terms. So we know we know what what are the the possible combinations for the, the the theoretical models that describe a given system. And so the goal here is to to narrow down that that, that selection using using the the these these techniques from from machine learning. Of course, this this is for a two stream a two stream instability. And what Paulo as expected, derived was uh, was uh, the Vlasov equation and the slight corrections to the Vlasov equation. So it was possible to infer uh, the Vlasov equation from 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 data, and the inferred model is what's in, on the right hand side. Uh, so the FTT and then a term which is close to one, but it's not one, and then the convective uh, the, uh, the the convective term, and then the the the, the first term. Uh, which should be very close to one, and but it's not one as expected since we are dealing with with uh, with data. Uh, so what what is what is interesting here is that, uh, and this is a, a critical point, is that on peak simulations we are not explicitly solving uh, the Vlasov equation, but it was possible to to infer that this system was obeying the Vlasov equation. So the challenge, uh, of course, is not is not to rediscover a textbook plasma physics, but to understand what are the reduced set of equations that describe that describe more complex systems, and uh, and and so here on the right hand side we have the discovery of a kinetic plasma equation directly from the from the the, the, um, the simulation of the peak simulations. Uh, he has also rediscovered the fluid equations. From uh, from simulations of the Weibull instability, he inferred the continuity equation, inferred the momentum equation, and also uh, the MHD equations. Why is this interesting? Uh, again, I, I, wa I want to stress that uh, inferring inferring equations that are on textbooks uh, they they validate the approach. But what is really interesting is that for very for more complex problems where uh, where we we don't know the exact equations of state or the closure or the closure equations for a, for instance for a, a set of fluid equations this provides uh, an automatic technique to to address uh, to address the, the these questions and it's definitely uh, what I think I would like to highlight a, a promising approach to accelerate theoretical insight so it's it's to use machine learning to actually advance advance our theoretical insight in the, into these complex nonlinear plasma dynamics. And with the goal, of course, to develop improved reduced models for multi-scale plasma simulations. So I'm closing to the summary and I think I'm probably a little bit over my time, but I just wanted to highlight that uh, kinetic particle in cell simulations they do play an important role in exploring understanding many lab and astrophysics scenarios. I've just described a very narrow subset of uh, lab scenarios involving intense lasers and, and the examples are all, it's also a, a very narrow uh, region of space of, uh, of uh, scenarios where particle and cell simulations do play a role but in astrophysics we also uh, they, are, they are quite common to describe neutron stars, pulsars, the magnetospheres around black holes and all that so these are these are very powerful technique and uh, Peak simulations are prepared to take advantage of the exascale resources, and there are many possibilities for the interplay with artificial intelligence and machine learning, but not, not that many mature examples. So for, for students or uh, young researchers, this is definitely an area where I see many low-hanging fruits and many, many possibilities for significant advances. So this is what I wanted to share with you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luis, 
for the great talk. Um, let us open this up for questions. So if you have a question, please write it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, yes, uh, can, there's can a question hear me? from Klaus. Exactly. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. So my question would be, or oh, actually I have two. Uh, one is the optimization run regarding the laser profile. How long does it actually take? Is it something that oh. takes a significant amount of time even for a student or? Uh... Oh, no, no, these are, these are very, these are, uh, what I've shown here are 2D runs. So these, these are actually, they, they, these runs are not even done with, with, uh, in mass, with, uh, with those areas. They are done with the ZIPIC, which is our educational code. So these are very small runs. It's just, uh, you just run hundreds, thousands of runs just to, to go through all the, all the parameters and all that. So this, this is definitely one of the advantages of, of uh, peak simulations that you have such a mature algorithm and now you have such powerful computers that you can uh, you can very easily uh, build your data sets for any any machine learning process very very quickly so this is this is dev this is not state of the art this is not exascale uh, uh, you don't need ex exascale resources to to optimize for the example that I gave here of course this is for a 2d run but uh, uh, in 3D, uh, this is probably not uh, not strictly true, but the runs are still not that large, I would say, even in, in 3D. Okay, thank you. So there is another question in the chat uh, from Emily Lewis. Uh, she's asking, do you see any value in using neural networks to build a surrogate for the entirety of the OSIRIS code? Well, uh, I, well, for, I, I, I see this quite as a quite challenging, quite a challenging uh, uh, endeavor in the sense that uh, replacing the 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 whole the whole code uh, with uh, with neural networks might not be. I don't I don't see it uh, as very practical. Uh, I would say uh, I would. Uh, in the, in why, or, and why I'm saying this is that, well, the, the, the code has many, many different uh, uh, simulation modes, has many different initial conditions. So I would say that for, uh, let's imagine that I'm designing a laser plasma accelerator, uh, for instance, in the, in the, like in the work that Bernardo Malaki is doing, pro probably, probably we, I would say that if we have a, a relatively, um, well-defined set of parameters for the laser uh, and uh, then then we can and for the plasma then we can probably train train a, uh, uh, train a neural network uh, for uh, to make to make uh, relatively fast predictions on the on on, on the outputs so if we are if we are looking at uh, uh, trying to get uh, very quick uh, answers for uh, with a very fast turnaround time, uh, for instance, in connection with an experiment, I do see, uh, I do see this that this would be possible to replace the, the whole code. Uh, I, I think it can be quite 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 a challenge, uh, quite a challenge. Um, but um, I would say if if we if we are looking at a relatively narrow a set of uh, uh, initial conditions or setups, then this this is possible. I, I, I think this is worth, and this is the ideas that are underlying the work on laser plasma accelerators are precisely this one. We we would have we would have a we would have a layer that would allow us to make very fast predictions based on a, on, a, on a range of input parameters for the laser and the plasma. Uh, but for the entirety, I see it a little bit more challenging. But, um, but we are just starting to think about this. So it might not be 
seeing the whole uh, the whole potential of uh, of neural networks. Thank you. Uh, there is a question by Anton Lebedev. Please, please go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Shut up. Uh, so um, just a um, quick clarification. Um, the um, machine learning, which you m mentioned with a, uh, with a 2D case, uh, has it been already tried in a fully 3D simulation at all, even a small scale? Or has it just been purely two-dimensional? I think this has been tried in 3D. There is no publication on this yet. So. The results that I'm referring here have been published on a, on a, um, uh, they have been published on a proceedings of the European of the EPS conference. Um, I, I think I've seen some results in 3D. Uh, I think it's on the thesis, uh, the master thesis of Bernardo Malaca. The results are there, uh, but these are the published results, the ones that I showed here. Uh, if if you're interested, you can drop me an email, and I'll be happy to share the. The, the thesis with you, and uh, we can we can go through that or put you in contact with with Bernardo, definitely. Attila, you're muted. Thanks. <laughs> There's another chat in the uh, another question in the chat by Ling and Juan. Could you explain a bit more? about the data-driven discovery from PIC simulation data. Specifically, which new discoveries do you expect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so this is, uh, let, let me just stress that this is work done by Paul Walsh. Uh, so this is not work done in my group. Uh, and what, uh, what he aims to use this for is to uh, to explore uh, scenarios where uh, you want to uh, find what is what are what is the reduced fluid equations uh, that you can use for for describing a more complex uh, plasma process. Of course, when you when you're when you're using a set of reduced equations, you know that well the the first the first equation would be the continuity equation. Then you have the conservation of momentum equation, uh, but uh, when Already there on the conservation of momentum equation, you can have uh, you, you can have equation you can have uh, to guarantee the closure of the of of your uh, momentum conservation equation. You need to assume some equation of state. If you could uh, devise what is the equation of state that best describe the the system at hand, this would be quite quite a significant progress. So we has been looking at different uh, different scenarios. Uh, with more uh, high energy density uh, uh, physics uh, scenarios uh, and also more fundamental processes associated with space physics, but this is this is the goal. So to to understand uh, reduced models from the simulation data that that can then be used as. <coughs> That, that, that can then be used as uh, as theoretical uh, surrogates for for the for the processes that that we are that we are exploring. So this is this is what what they are aiming for. We know that the system is kinetic. We know that there are a set of reduced equations that can describe this kinetic system. What what is the best set of reduced equations that we can that we can use? Um, another question from the audience. Uh, Klaus wants to ask a question. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. So the other question is also regarding uh, this discovery from the simulation data. Uh, have you seen, or maybe you know the study well enough, have you seen any scaling of these factors that were inferred uh, from the simulations uh, with the sampling? Uh, yeah, the, I, I cannot give you a detailed answer, but this is uh, on the talk that uh, Paulo gave at the APS, and he, that is going to give uh, also this year at the APS. He has, he has made, a, uh, I've seen the preprint of the paper, uh, but uh, he has studied this in detail. So this has been, uh, this has been uh, of course, uh, as you know, this is a critical, a critical point. 
uh, to understand how fast can we can we get to the or how, or how close to the equations can we get? And this uh, this has been thoroughly studied. Yes, yeah, I can I cannot give you the details, but but this is in the in the papers and uh, and in the presentations of Paul. Yes. Okay. Um, I have a question myself um, on, in particular, like you talked a little bit about the first principles data integration into PIC codes um, in, in with this Vaslov equation. Do you see, where do you see other opportunities where first principles methods could be integrated or could provide input for PIC simulations? Yeah, well, when uh, well, the advantage of uh, the advantage of the peak method is um, is that uh, the core the core by itself is an ab initio description of the plasma. So we have just very few approximations. As we start to have these layers ionization or or uh, or uh, or QED processes, we can we could also aim uh, for us to understand uh, the evolution of the QED cascade using uh, similar techniques. What would be the? I, I can I can think what what would be the fluid equation, of course, with the source term. What would be the the source term on the fluid equations that best describes a QED cascade? Okay, we know that this is very going to be very similar to ionization-like process. So, uh, but are there are there corrections due to the fact that we are dealing with a, a relativistically hot uh, plasma? Uh, and what kind of corrections are these to the equation of state? So I, I see that this is uh, this approach of uh, of discovery of of inference of uh, of our uh, of our uh, more uh, more reduced uh, set of equations. I think it's pretty general and can be can be used in a wide variety of uh, of processes. Uh, Paulo Paulo Alves has been uh, looking at these uh, more. More fundamental processes to make sure that he makes he makes this bridge, but I, I see that this is pretty general to any 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 other process. And as you as you can imagine, if we have reduced sets of equations that have that are somehow validated by the data, then you are much more comfortable to use these these equations in a, to to understand uh, and to understand the process from a theoretical perspective. So I think this is this is I think this is quite original because. Uh, we don't usually see machine learning being used this way uh, to find to find the theoretical equations. So I think this is quite quite original. There is another group in the in University of Washington, Seattle, that is pursuing this. Uh, that I think it's referenced on on the slides that I showed. This is the paper that is is Brunton Brunton et al. on the proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in 2016. Uh, so I think this is one. Uh, I, I really I asked Paulo to to be able to show his slides here because I really think this is this is really original in terms of uh, the uses of machine learning for for uh, advancing our theoretical understanding of uh, of fundamental of fundamental processes in this case fundamental plasmas but I don't see any other reason why uh, why we can't use this. Uh, Whenever we have a, a, a NAB issue description, a NAB issue computational description of the system, and we want to understand reduced equations for this. Yes. Thank you. Um, the final chance for a question from the audience. Okay. If there isn't any uh, other question from the audience, then I'd like to thank uh, Louis again. Thank you very much for being here. Okay. Um, thank, thank you for thank you for having me, and thank you for listening, and thank you for the questions. It's been a pleasure, um, and uh, I really hope that I can uh, come to Casus soon. <laughs> I think this would be this would be a good sign for everyone. I think absolutely yes, you'd be very welcome here. Thanks again. Um, we'll have a short break, and then we will continue with um, the next talk in about eight minutes at five p.m. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much.